this this theory will just it, it's gonna i i do think it has a good chance of absolutely obliterating gender ideology um and i think that'll be a good thing hello everybody and welcome to another episode of body politics today I'm very excited to introduce everyone to my friend and author of the book, Auto Heterosexual, Phil Illy, who is a professional transvestite, <laughs> which is very exciting. Probably one of the only professional transvestites who also has written a massive book on autogynophilia, autoandrophilia, and other autosexual orientations. So congratulations about that niche that you've that you've colonized. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Raven. Yeah, it's quite the niche. <laughs> quite the niche, yes. And um, so yeah, Owen and I are gonna be hosting this conversation um, to dive deep into the two type, two type model of transgenderism and try and understand, uh, yeah, transgender, transgenderism and all of its other facets and fascinations. So thanks for being here today, Phil. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so I thought we'd start with a little bit about your own journey into this. Like, why was it that you even found yourself researching this topic so deeply in the first place? Um, well, I had wished that I was female for quite some time, but didn't understand the thoughts. So I just tried to push them away. And then... I, at one point, had gotten in some tense discussions with a former romantic partner about some woke stuff, and, you know, after that relationship inevitably ended, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I went to the library, and I, I got a bunch of books on transsexualism to, like, see if I, it seemed like I didn't know much about it. And so I wanted to learn more. And then I came across the concept of autogynophilia in a couple of those books. And I just got obsessed reading about it because it kind of blew my mind that I apparently had this type of sexuality that I had never heard of and that the trans movement was covering up. And so that was just, you know, that's just a really weird situation to come across where you're like, oh, I have this sexual orientation I never heard of, and the people that have it the most strongly are the ones covering it up. It's just very strange. Extremely bizarre. But you, as you talk about in the book, like there's some ways that we can understand that by understanding uh, auto sexuality more deeply. So we'll, we'll hopefully get into some of that. So in the book, um, you're basically doing a huge synthesis of a lot of the existing literature. Who are some of the, the people that you read or the, the major sexologists throughout history that influenced your writing of the book and your understanding of, of your own sexuality? Um, yeah, it's the book is a big synthesis. Um, and it I heavily drew upon Hirschfeld, like Magnus Hirschfeld's absolute top dog of early sexology. Um, He's an absolute legend. He's the one that coined the term transvestite and thus created the trans category we know of today. And, and when was that? When was he? 1910. Okay. Was, so, when, was when he came out with that book. So we've known about this <laughs> in, in, for, for at least a century now. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So him and then who came afterwards? Then, like Havelock Ellis was shortly after him. Um, he was an English sexologist, so that was easier for me to read because I didn't have to rely on a translation. Um, so that's nice. And yeah, and those were the early ones I read. And then in terms of like the post-war sexology, you know, in like the 70s and 80s, um, the biggest name is probably Ray Blanchard because he worked in a gender clinic in Toronto for 15 years. And his job was to try to figure out how many types of trans are there. And he figured it out. <laughs> and so he did good at his job. 
And that's what's called the two type model, right? Of right. Transgenderism. Yeah. Yeah. Blanchard proposed the two type model for, for, for trans, for like male to female transsexuals. Um, and he proposed that one type is homosexual and the other type is autogynephilic, which is um, attracted to being a woman. Mm -hmm. It's basically heterosexuality pointed at yourself. And he, he's also the one that came up with the broader autosexual theory that explains other forms of trans identity, such as like trans species and trans ableism and things like that. Mm -hmm. But he didn't make those he didn't like follow the theory through to those ideas. That's something that you've done, right? Well, he he's the one that proposed that original, the erotic target identity inversion theory yeah. that basically, for, his theory was just talking about males. Um, I think it applies to both sexes, but his theory about males was that basically, you know, a certain subset of men will be attracted to being the same type of thing they're attracted to. And this can lead to, you know, age identity disorder, you know, as he called it back then, or, um, you know, other forms of like dysphoria associated with various attributes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And, and so he, he was a pretty big deal. And then after, after him, there's been sexologists such as Michael Bailey and Kevin Sue and, and Anne Lawrence that have, you know, conducted further studies to sort of flesh out the model that Blanchard traced out. And, and it seems that Blanchard's insights are, are generally correct, as far as I can tell. So that's, that's like the best idea that we have so far about how this, how to sort out these two different um, expressions of autosexuality uh is is the homosexual and the autosexual do you want can you right. talk about some of the differences between those two um so so homosexual i guess yeah homosexual transsexualism is is something that occurs in some masculine lesbians and and feminine gay men and they typically show gender nonconformity from a very young age and um, when they transition, they be, they basically slot into heteronormative society, and so it's it's sort of a big social win, and it, it integrates them into society better, and it it let lets them find sexual partners that they're really attracted to, you know, and so th yeah, that that's homosexual transsexualism is one type, and that one's not related to autosexuality. It's it's like a byproduct of the fact that humans are sexually dimorphic and homosexuality is associated with a cross-gender shift in psychological traits. And, and in rare cases, this can result in transsexualism. Um, yeah, and the, basically the auto-heterosexual type is either female autoandrophilia, love of self as man, or male autogynephilia, love of self as woman. And that's what I have. And it just makes you attracted to embodying whatever you find attractive or beautiful in the other sex. Mm -hmm. So this also points out a dimension of sexuality that is interesting, which is that there's, there's basically two directions. And it's also, I guess, what erotic target location error implies to me is there's a spatial dimension of sexuality as it's being developed in, 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 in early childhood, I guess. That's kind of when you begin to sort out what is it to be attracted to. So can you kind of talk about <laughs> what, what's going on in those early years and what the erotic target location error is? What it is it like to direct sexual energy outward towards an other versus directing it inwardly towards oneself that whole structure yeah the, yeah like you said there's this there's this dimension of sexual orientation that um is about the direction in which it's oriented um whether it's self or other and this usually referred referred to as the location dimension mm -hmm. and just because of the locations in the you know erotic target location error it's like in the name and 
um, basically these are just like the allosexual interests are, are like externally directed sexual interests and the autosexual interests are internally directed sexual interests. And basically if someone has these, um, they tend to, our sexual orientations tend to, you know, give us some show up a little bit when we're young, you know, and they become more apparent during puberty, but there's early signs um, before puberty. And someone who has conventional allosexual attractions will, you know, maybe develop crushes on their peers. And someone who has predominantly autosexual attractions will, you know, maybe be compelled to, to cross-dress or to, you know, behave like the other sex or think of themselves as the other sex or, you know, pray to God at night that they're going to wake up as a girl or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was really amazing in your book how much you relied on historical um, narratives in order to, I think, both kind of get us into the minds of people who have this orientation um, and be able to empathize, but also to show that this is something that has persisted throughout human history and um, ha it, it hasn't been so influenced by culture as we may kind of stereotypically think of it today, like as this being like a modern problem, but this is something that has existed, you know, um, right. for, for a while. And people have described, like there's a Hungarian physician that you bring up in the book quite a lot who describes yeah. all sorts of situations. Can you talk a little bit about this character and, and what yeah, it meant for yeah. you to find this person and just be like, oh my God, like... <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, she's she's very AGP. Um, <laughs> she, so this Hungarian physician narrative is from Kraft Ebbing Psychopathia Sexualis, which is the first book on. It, it's it could be arg arguably is like the foundational text of sexology, as far as I can tell. It was the first textbook on paraphilias, and it just has hundreds of different case studies of people that wrote in to him, you know, after reading his book, you know, there's a bunch of editions, you know, he released one and then people wrote to him saying, I have this weird sex thing. And then he just kept adding to it. And one of these cases in there was by this Hungarian doctor who like has full, had full fledged autogynophilia. It had like all the subtypes of it. You know, she described it in detail, you know, and I'm using she as a pronoun just cause like, I can tell she had the orientation strongly and you know it's sort of safer to use cross-gender pronouns in terms of what people get offended by these days so um yeah i just wrote about the hungarian physician's account and and used it quite a bit because any aspect of autogynophilia there's an example in her first-hand account of it and it, it's very lengthy because she was a doctor so she was atypically educated for her time and so that's why it was so good that you know there's other narratives that are shorter and not as thorough but this was an intelligent well-educated person and so it's a particularly good narrative oh yeah amazing I loved the descriptions of of, of like clothing and you know the, like wanting to cover the skin and <laughs> you know yeah, like wanting to wear a mask to cover her beard so like she could recognize <laughs> herself in the mirror yes like yes being feminine <laughs> Um, yeah, which actually brings us into the, the different embodiment subtypes, right? So yeah, there's all these different dimensions to which like someone might be attracted to embodying their, their cross gender self that you bring up in the book. There's anatomic, physiologic, sartorial, behavioral, interpersonal. So we have all these dimensions. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about them? And the question I have as well is like, can one kind of dominate like over others or do they co-arise in most cases? Um, they, well, person will tend to have multiple of them, you know, if they have the orientation. Um, but basically these subtypes are, they tend to line up with things that are different between the sexes, you know? Males and females have different bodies and different bodily functions. They tend to behave differently, dress differently, and have different social roles. And, and they also tend to, to think differently and have different sorts of feelings about things. And so 
these differences between sexes show up in the form of the types of embodiment that auto heterosexuals like to have so that they can symbolize, you know, being the other sex. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, um, you asked whether a person can have just one type or have multiple. And there are cases where sometimes people just have the anatomic type. And mm. so they just want, they just really want the body. And, and the old old investigators such as Hirschfeld and Havelock Ellis, they considered these types to be the most strongly predisposed to it and to represent the condition in its most pure form um, when they just wanted to have the body. Mm -hmm. And someone like that today would be a transsexual for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, generally people have multiple of the subtypes going on at any given time. Mm -hmm. So, and, and like anatomical features would be like the one that you, you talk about as being the most prominent is, is wanting breasts, right? Like that's like the big, that's <laughs> well, the big thing. Well, who wouldn't want breasts? I mean, says the autogonophile. Except for the auto androphiles <laughs> who definitely right, no, don't want breasts. No, very good point. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, like, no, uh, autogonophiles, they want breasts. It's like the biggest, the thing they want most. And I would say auto androphiles. It seems like they typically want a flat chest or to have a dick the mm -hmm. most. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense. These, makes sense. These sort of protrusions are pretty powerful symbolically. And whenever you look down, you see them. It, they're right below your face. So it makes sense that these weigh particularly heavily. Yeah, things on the front of the body are, are I think, very uh, strongly associated with identity. You know, you, your yeah. sense of being in your own body, obviously, because I like, I, um, you know, the butt isn't necessarily that popular, right, for for the anatomical transitions for male to females. But butts could be a very, like, you know, female characteristic, right? But like, it's, it's like, well, you don't see your butt. So it's like, well, you're not as overly identified with it as, as male or female or, you know, masculine or feminine, but breasts, obviously. And then, yeah, for for autoandrophiles, like the absence of breasts. It's amazing, just like how much breasts like dominate our reality. <laughs> <laughs> they're there, yeah. they're not there, <laughs> like what they're doing. Um, I guess you love them, like, you hate them. You, yeah, you don't want them, you have them, you don't want them, you don't have them, you want them. It's like, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, it's, it's, unbel that's unbelievable. Um, and yet here we are. And then there's also like the physiological aspects of it, which is quite interesting. Like, and um, even to the point of having kind of phantom experiences of yeah. other parts. Can, what is going on there? What is this phantom situation? Has anybody done research like more deeply into what is going on in people's minds when, when they're experiencing like having a uterus? or having a dick like what what do you know about this phenomenon um so i've seen s some study there's some limited studies on um phantom anatomy in gender non-conforming people and the you know the study i, I can remember that the study that has the biggest sample that i can think of it <laughs> like all the charts were showing it in terms of male and female, you know, about like males imagine this body part, females imagine this one, until you get down to the chart that talks about sexuality and then they merge the two sexes together so that you can't tell <laughs> whether <laughs> whether um, it's cross-gender arousal or like same-gender arousal. Um, but uh, I, that's just me griping about yeah. what I think a scientist covering up obvious signs of autogynophilia and autoandrophilia but mm -hmm. um with the the phantom anatomy um it can happen with any type of autosexual orientation you know like i came across the concept of phantom shifts when i was reading about other kin and which are people with non-human identities and some of them talk about experiencing wings and fur and dragon or dragon wings and you know, having a muzzle or teeth or paws, things like that. And that when they describe it, they talk as if it actually imp impacts their sense of proprioception. Like they'll change how they move their body so that they don't like 
squish their tail when sitting down or like trap it in a door and, and things like that. And so it, as far as I could tell, this phantom anatomy is, it has something to do with proprioception, our sense of our, our where our body parts are positioned um, and our mental self-representation of where our body is. Um, and so, yeah, it seems like some auto heterosexuals can feel as if they have body parts pertaining to the the other sex, you know, like they may, like an auto androphile, for instance, might feel that their shoulders are wider or that their hips are narrower than they actually are, or feel that, you know, they don't actually have breasts or, or, or in particular, like they can feel as if they have a dick. And this generally would happen in an erotic scenario, most commonly, but yeah, autoandrophiles pretty commonly have had the experience of having a phantom dick before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like this aspect of um, auto heterosexuality would be one of the main kind of sources of uh, like suffering like gender dysphoria, right? Like, or, or just feeling alienated from your actual body, right? Because you're like having a phantom experience of another organ or like, like, like literally feeling as if you have the presence of this thing and then you verify with your appearance whether or not you have it and you know that you don't. Is that, is that something, is that true? That conclusion that I have in my head or? I, that hasn't been researched yet to know how much the phantom shifts in particular contribute to um, the body mind incongruence associated with transsexualism, but I do think that they contribute to it because they make you feel as if you're supposed to have a different type of body. So, yeah. yeah. And that's a lot of what um, kind of transgender people talk about more, I guess, mythologically today right they're, they're speaking about like feeling as if they should have had another body or feeling as if they do have another body so that sensation of the, the phantom sensation just from a first po person point of view without understanding kind of the bigger more abstract model of how this might arise in someone um could easily lead to a story like that does does that check out for you or do you think that there's other reasons why we have that story kind of floating around um, the mean plexes of transgenderism there i mean there the phantom stuff is just one of the contributors to that story um you know there's also the mental shifts where they feel like they have the mind of the other gender oh, yes. um and there's also just if when you have these autosexual orientations it can be hard to differentiate between liking something and being something <laughs> you know like if if you see a beautiful woman if you're autogynephilic it, it can make you can have the sort of sensation of like that should be me or you know or that is me or yeah um I mean I don't personally when I see women I don't think that that is me and that should be me mm -hmm. it's more of like sometimes it's like dang that would be nice to be that but um mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah when you have these these auto sexual orientations it, it can just make it hard to, it gives you a sensation of being something. And that can be confusing if it conflicts with, you know, sort of what your physical form is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, that makes sense. Um, and I guess it, it becomes especially obvious when you look at something like trans species, right? Because you're like, this person thinks that they have a tail like suddenly we're looking at, we can understand there's an underlying phenomenon here. It's not just something that's about having the gender of another person. There's some deeper thing going on or the situation with like, you know, phantom limbs with amputees or the inverse of that, which is people who feel as if their arms should be amputeed, right? Like there's clearly some sort of thing going on in the human mind. <laughs> in relation to this like proprioception that, that you mentioned it's extremely curious yeah and those various types you mentioned like the transabled people they typically say that they're sexually attracted to amputees mm -hmm. uh, and the trans species people um 
I've looked at a lot of community surveys of Therians and other kin, and the percent of them that report sexual interest in furries and in real animals vastly exceeds what you'd expect in the, the general population. And so an attraction to animals also seems related to trans species identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that is a curious point to me because it does seem like when you talk about this section in the book that there's some people who seem to, to give themselves over completely to this cross gender, cross species or, you know, whatever cross spirit inside of them. And then their sexuality can become almost entirely directed towards the self so while it does seem like there's parallel kind of attraction if you're very attracted to women then your attraction to yourself as woman would kind of be equal to that but that there's also some amount of variation um especially once somebody decides to kind of reinforce the pattern of behavior and you know manifestation and identifying as the cross spirit inside of them is am i getting that right or uh, yeah, there is, everyone has um, a different proportion of their sexuality that's externally directed and a proportion that's internally directed. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that um, when people have these types of trans identity, that they often have the internally directed component of their sexuality is stronger. And then through repetition, um, that internal self becomes more salient and real and, and more strongly tied into their identity. And, and this all reinforces those behaviors that led to the feelings in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, it, it does seem that um, doing the behaviors that, that please that inner autosexual self, that it tends to strengthen that and reinforce those behavioral pathways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's interesting because like your book your book is very feels very materialistic and scientific it's just very grounded right in that way but then there's also something that feels a little bit more mystical to me or something like this this idea of like the cross gender spirit or like this this entity there's like some sort of like possession or something like an entity of some kind that can kind of like can you can you unpack that more like is that is there a way, um, is that just like a more poetic way of talking about it and there is a more grounded scientific way or is it just trying to point at something that's so like intangible as to necessarily evoke this kind of... <laughs> I do language. talk about it in terms of the spirit be sometimes just because it, it does seem to be an immaterial thing, like a mental construct. Um, I've seen some other AGPs like refer to it as like the artifact <laughs> or like it's... Yeah, it's it's just this artifact. mental construct. Yeah, I think that's what, what one of them called mean? it. I I think that's referred to like the artificeness of it. This was someone I was trying to repress at the time, I think. Ah, um, okay. Makes sense. Yeah, it's there's so much tied in with like what your plans are for transition will will impact your strategy and how you think of it. You know, like transvestites have an incentive to not give too much to that cross gender self, and then transsexuals have an incentive to put all the importance in that cross gender self. And so there's this antagon, there can be this like conflict between transvestites and transsexuals because of their different levels of commitment to this cross gender spirit. Mm -hmm. And also I'm imagining like a lot of internal contradictions and, and conflict as well, right? Because you have, okay, so you're going throughout your life and you're experiencing your default gender which is how you kind of identify, allow us to kind of ground this, this circulating of identities and attractions in your book. So you have your default setting that is supposedly kind of in alignment with whatever you're, you're born, your sex is, right? Right, and it's then, just like your, yeah, your physical form, basically. Yeah, physical form, you have a sex and your gender is in alignment with it. And then at some point, I guess for auto heterosexuals, a lot of this happens during puberty because you're getting all of these sex hormones and your libido increases, right? So that charges your sexuality. So of course, during that time, you're going to also see your sexual orientation, you know, grow and mature. And that's when people often 
seem to begin to understand that they have a, a form of, of transgenderism. Is that correct as well? Yeah, that during during puberty, that cross gender drive ramps up because you know if you're sex, sexually oriented towards being the other sex, you might have some of those feelings before puberty now and then. But then after puberty ramps up, it, that your brain will be searching for whatever fulfills its sexual orientation, and that will be being the other gender. And so, yeah, puberty can be a time of crisis for auto heterosexuals as all of a sudden their body is changing in ways that conflict with this new strong desire to be the other sex and so there's a lot it, it creates inner tension yeah because you you have your default self and up, i mean I, I bet as well like an identity associated with that and attachments and all sorts of, right you know yeah you spent at least 10 years forming that self at that point exactly uh, a name you know all sorts of things and then you start to have this arousal pathway emerge inside of you that is related to a way that you see yourself across gender, across spirit. And then there's also seems like an implication that it, it can grow in its intensity, like that it can take over, like you use this language at some point, like it can take over yeah. the whole self. <laughs> yeah it can take over the self-system yeah okay all right so what what is that <laughs> what so is that? so like what's happening there as, as yeah. far as i can tell um there's like this default self that we we're just talking about that builds up you know and then during and then there's also this cross-gender self that is created by the orientation and through reinforcement it gets stronger and and because our sexuality has so much power to tell us what matters, like what's important in life and what do we want out of it. Um, this cross-gender self can become the one that is in charge of the overall self-system at some point, you know, and historically this would happen to like cross-dressers in their forties or whatever. Um, back when society was more repressive towards gender variants and they tend to stay inside. So it took a little slower to develop but now that the trans movement is around and people are, you know, getting puberty blockers and transitioning super early, um, they're kind of handing the reins to their cross-gender self earlier. And it's sort of bypassing this long drawn out conflict between these two selves and instead just like handing it to that cross-gender self earlier. Um, but yeah, basically the, this orientation can create another self inside of you and that self can grow to have the strongest sway over your actions and desires and that this can result in transsexualism this sense of two selves is super interesting right that's it reminds me of various things so for example in the um tibetan spirituality they talk about these tulpas which you can grow if you if you work consciously you can grow an entity inside of you or like with occult practices often you find ways to talk and interact with archetypal entities spirits however you want to think of it um i remember a friend of mine once saying to me i mean you seem like you have a a two soul uh personality i guess and he was someone again who had done I think he was quite into Mayan shamanism. So there's all these different ways, mythical or poetic ways of framing it. Um, and I always liked one of the ways that Camille Paglia speaks about these androgynous figures often being very artistic. Um, in her work, she says these artistic men often have a very strong feminine side and artistic women often have a very strong masculine side. And again, to kind of look at my personal phenomenology it definitely feels like there's always this kind of internal erotic relationship going on between on the one hand I'm kind of a man masculine body but then this humongous emotional self that has these dramatic ups and downs and crises but it can kind of be channeled into music or writing or uh, performance these various things and I always like the kind of thinking of that that dance and the tension between these two selves is something that can be intensely productive and creative 
yeah the relationship between the two selves if if you channel it right it, it can be productive and it, and it doesn't necessarily detract from life quality or anything like that um yeah and you actually mentioned the the second self thing and it reminded me of how the the first long-standing transvestite organization it, it was it was named the society for the second self mm. and um yeah that organization is kind of phasing out now that transgenderism has been destigmatized there's not much need for cross-dressers to like meet in uber secrecy to cross-dress together anymore um but maybe they still should <laughs> <laughs> maybe they still should do this <laughs> what secretly <laughs> instead of publicly maybe they can do both you know right yeah you know it's it's yeah, I I mean, this is interesting, right? Because then it also gets back to that distinction between, say, the transvestites and the transsexuals, I think, where you've got on the one hand the people who have two selves and will go between them, whether it's drag or whether it's cross dressing. And then there's the people who really want to take this second self and make that the core of their identity and go through often quite drastic medical procedures in order to do that. Yeah. And, and they're, that is like historically how people separated between like with the gender variant population they sort of differentiated between here's the ones that just like do the clothing and it's sort of balanced and then here's the ones that go all the way and they're hardcore yeah, um, hardcore. yeah. <laughs> we can all agree that transsexualism is pretty hardcore it's not saying it's bad but it's intense yeah it's super intense yeah it definitely takes it all the way um <laughs> Or as far as oh. you can go. It's <laughs> right. the ultimate yeah. shapeshift of practice. Right? Oh, it's, yeah. And I think thinking of it as a type of initiation in the same way, I mean, it's not the same thing. I, well, I don't know, but Raven and I were talking recently about the castrati in the history of the church. Again, these kind of intense permanent modifications in order to unlock new human capacities. Yeah, it's... I'm glad we're not castrating kids so that they can sing better <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but, I think of that as moral progress. <laughs> right. But yeah, I guess now the moral question is, is it okay to castrate kids because of their gender feelings, you know? Um, yeah, of course. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you actually brought up Tolpomancy earlier and it reminded me of um, how um, I've started... I started paying attention to the online like dissociative identity disorder scene of like the people with multiple personalities and like the systems and the plurals, you know, uh -huh. and I noticed that they have a lot of the mental traits that auto heterosexuals have in terms of like ADHD and autism and things like that. And I was wondering if somehow these people that are plural, if their multiple selves are being caused by autosexuality. Um, this is something that I haven't investigated deeply yet. I'm just, I'm just observing now the various online communities, how they talk to each other and looking at overlaps and membership between subreddits and such. But I wouldn't be surprised if also the, the people that identify as plural, if, if their various selves are ultimately an outgrowth of autosexuality. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting to think about um, like the, the co- arising or like the probabilistically co-arising mental um disorders that that people tend to have with this type of sexuality which is like autism adhd what are the other types of um twists in neurotype um that um, seem to be correlated with this i will say that i didn't i haven't seen any signs of reduced mental disorders among this population so <laughs> just in general they probably have more mental disorders mm -hmm. um but it does seem that autism is particularly prevalent like among trans people maybe about six times as common as mm -hmm. in the general population and also um yeah among autists themselves being trans is roughly you know six times as common so it does seem that autism in particular is somehow related to the development of gender variants mm -hmm. very very interesting connection there's also 
of course, a, a clue in, in the words, right? Auto, autism. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. The, both the words start with the Greek root from autos, which is self. Mm -hmm. And so autism, I think it got that name originally because it just sort of, it reflects the general turn inward that is seen among autists. They have this like inner world that's going on that's very real to them. And um, with autosexual orientations, it's about attraction to this woman or man or any type of entity inside of you. It's an internalized sexuality. And so it it wouldn't surprise me if if there was um if sometimes autism caused the development of these autosexual orientations, you know, because if if you're having a bunch of your psychology turn inward, then I, it makes sense that if that happened in the realm of sexual orientation, that it would lead to this autosexuality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting. And, and you're also autistic, right? So yeah, I have the tism for sure. Yeah. That, this book would not, this, this thick ass book I wrote would not have been written if it weren't for the tism. There's just no way, <laughs> you know? Um, Yes, well, we have a lot to thank the autists for in terms of civilization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, they seriously, they hold technological society together and build it. They're amazing. They do indeed. Thank you, autists, for your service. <laughs> yes. Um, but, okay, so you can really speak both from, uh, you know, a kind of an academic perspective on autism, not that you're the expert, but, you know, and also from, from a personal experience. Like, so the, the inward ness of autism for you is it um does it feel like the same thing as as your sexuality or like you like how do they fit together inside of your mind um or your experience? I never really directly connected them before doing all this research and noticing that there seems to be a connection um okay. so it didn't that yeah I never had the thought that like oh maybe my like before I understood this, when I wanted to cross dress or whatever, I didn't think, does this mean I'm autistic? You know, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, before I understood, I might worry, like, does this mean I'm like gay or like what is this? You know, but um, yeah, it's it's really hard to say the effect of autism here, but it there's some research on it that shows that people with autism, they have, they tend to have less of a sense of belonging to others of their gender, you know, and, and it can be harder for them to be socialized into various genders. And so even aside from this autosexuality element, it seems like autism independently contributes to um, gender variants in that it makes people feel like aliens among others of their gender. Yeah, well, and it's certainly interesting in relation to something like, uh, like other kin, or like, I mean, being truly feeling alien, like truly identifying with like a, a sexual self that is non human, or beyond human in some way. And of course, then that does, you know, make one think about something like transhumanism, or post humanism, as maybe an outgrowth of this type of inner, inner experience, you know, yeah. maybe both autism and but also like autosexuality as such um, yeah yeah i i agree that the the transhumanist impulse uh, a lot of the people who have it it's because they're attracted to being something that's not human or they're even just attracted to being the other gender and they like that transhumanism is in favor of these technologies to change sex sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting, too, because like what this is making me think of is you can, if you're interested in, if you're attracted to being something other than human or something other than the gender that you already have, sometimes you can devalue the your, your default sex or your default species, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, and then kind of elevate or lift up, you know, the other um and what you advocate in the book is is 
or at least maybe I'm reading into this, maybe you don't, but like, you know, something a little bit more accepting of, of both, of both sides. What would you say about that phenomenon or how people yeah, I think it's, handle that? I think it's good to, um, to be aware that this, like how this orientation works so that the people that have it, when, so that they don't devalue who they are, uh, just because their orientation is like coaxing them in that direction, because that leads to various forms of dysphoria. And, you know, since suffering is bad, um, I would want to reduce that. And so, yeah, I do generally think that um, with these autosexual orientations, it tends to elevate the worth of the thing that you're attracted to being. And inversely, like it, it devalues the worth of whatever your default form is because it's not that other thing that you really want to be mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i think also like i think with this model in general and your book does such an amazing job of just kind of putting all the pieces together and laying out all the dimensions of like okay what it would what would the inner experience of a person who has this type of condition be like and where would it maybe show up in their behaviors and their in their society, but like if you have this pain about your existing default sex, that you may project that in certain ways, like outwardly onto the world, right? Like you may you may resent men, you know, if you're a, a man and you want to transition to being a woman, or like is that something that it's possible yeah. as like an outgrowth of this phenomenon? Absolutely, you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like. It's quite common to see autogynophilic trans women saying that like men are trash. <laughs> like, <laughs> They're like radical feminists. Right. <laughs> and also, trans women. Yeah. Right. The the Venn diagram there where they overlap is all men are trash. And <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, I do see that that sort of thing happening where, you know, furries are going to care more about nature conservation and things like that. And mm. like, yeah, autoandrophiles will, you know, weigh more highly the perspective of men. Autogynophiles will like revere feminists, you know, it, this sort of pattern of admiring the type of entity that you love is very common. So interesting. So interesting. And also, I think, because uh, these, in the West, you talk about that uh, because of our openness around sexuality, now it's almost like the, the age of autosexuality, right? It's like you can express this inner self more openly in, in public. And now we're kind of seeing, okay, what is this kind of person? What is this kind of experience unleashed you know into social space and but people who have this situation don't even understand necessarily what's going on with them and of course your book is attempting to address that and and help to like reorient people not just people with the condition but also people in society so that we can like pattern recognize this <laughs> not only as an individual phenomenon but as a population level phenomenon because of course now with the internet all of these people can find each other and form an identity around this and then begin to act as a group instead of just as like isolated individuals and i think it's that's just it's so so important it's it's so helpful <laughs> for modeling things yeah i'm glad you found it helpful um i've i found it like it kind of blew my mind. Like after I learned about this, it made sense of so many different things, you know, sort of how the, just the, how the trans movement seems to operate. It like made a lot more sense after I understood the psychological motivations behind it. And it, yeah, I think it is important for not only people with the orientation, but also like say their friends and loved ones, like for them to understand each other better it would help if they understood the psychology. And so I'm, I'm hoping that um, this can help um, people that understand their romantic partners better, their friends, um, you know, just 
it depends on the situation, but basically, like you said, it helps to have a, to be able to pattern match in, in an accurate way and, and model society accurately. Yeah. Can we go back to something you mentioned earlier then, Phil, which is yeah. about the way that the autoerotic um, experience has been covered up. Yeah. So in, in 2003, a sexologist named Michael Bailey um, published a book called The Man Who Would Be Queen. And it was, it was mostly about gender nonconforming male homosexuality. But the last third of the book talked about the two-type transgender model, and it had a chapter on autogynophilia in it. And this motivated a group of privileged trans women. Like this, these are like um, transsexuals that have tenure and very esteemed positions in academia. They, they, they work together to try to get destroy Michael Bailey's reputation to whatever degree they could achieve. And this sort of, this was a message that if you talk about autogynophilia, we will destroy you. And academics heard that message and they have very carefully avoided talking about it for the most part. Um, it's now 20 years later after this first major cancellation happened. Um, and academics are still scared to talk about it. Um, and this cover up is so intense that there are not Wikipedia pages for autogynophilia and autoantrophilia. There are no pages with that name. There, um, the standards of care put out by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, the ones that doctors rely on, this, this, document which has many chapters including an entire chapter devoted to Unix there is not a single mention of autogynophilia or autoandrophilia in the entire thing like the most common cause of gender dysphoria is literally not mentioned in the manual given to clinicians who are tasked with treating gender dysphoria and so the clinicians don't understand the cause of the condition they're trying to treat and they don't even understand that there's two fundamentally different types of gender patient that they'll come across. So why? Is it a kind of political position that these original transgender or transsexual academics thought that if transsexuality is framed as a sexual orientation, as opposed to being something essential about people, then it won't be taken seriously and won't achieve its political goals? Or is there something else going on, do you think? Part of it is definitely a worry about the political consequences, you know, about people not taking their identity seriously and about discrimination and about not having access to medical care. Like the, these concerns are definitely part of the pushback. Um, I think though that the major thing that leads to the pushback is that it's it sharply conflicts with the, a beloved self-image you know like if you've devoted your life to living as this cross-gender persona at, because you love it so much then hearing about this theory that explains it in a way that says you're not that thing you just want to be that thing like they it's a really harsh um injury to their self-image and, and so they just they really don't like it Mm, it's like where well, it goes back to what we were saying about the the two personalities and the dance and how some people seem to really firmly identify with one and I suppose if you really firmly identify with one to the detriment to the other and it's the one that you weren't born in the body with then precisely like you said a theory like this if you're sensitive might seem to undermine it right yeah and there's that that fear that the trans movement does fear this theory. Um, they describe it as transphobic, pseudoscience, and hateful, and all the bad things. Um, but it does seem to be accurate, and so it's it's sort sort of tough situation here where there's this theory that 
seemingly describes so much. Um, and yet there are serious social consequences for talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. How, like, how are we going to get this implemented? Like, I'm trying to implement it. I don't, I hope it'll work. My, I just, I think the only thing to do is to try, but I, who knows if it'll work. Well, the, the shift in perspective, both on an individual and societal level is, is on the level of like a paradigm shift. Right, it's a it significant change <laughs> in the way that um, we're conceiving of this. And because it's also, you orient um, this whole model around sex as a biological category and that has two sides. And then from there, you can kind of build on top of it a understanding of how sexual orientation even functions and works. Like you, so you have this, that in and of itself is something we we can't quite figure out how to incorporate into our story <laughs> about what it means to be human. Um, yeah. so, um, and of course, it's it's not that that isn't something that could, I mean, who knows, maybe we'll make third gametes in the future using artificial gene editing technology or whatever. But as far as we're doing things right now today, like the, these are the two sexes that have evolved mammals have evolved in this dimorphic way and that's why we even have this pattern around sex and gender to begin with right so right. they're kind of all caught up together um so but then that's just the tip of the iceberg with this one <laughs> like that's just the beginning okay we have biological sex but then also associating this whole story um with sexual orientation rather than gender identity, I think is also something um, that understandably trans people might feel um, uncertain about, uh, given that sexuality is treated differently in society than gender identity. Uh, and I know that radical feminists who do talk about autogynophilia they don't talk about it in a nice way. They no, <laughs> they're mean. <laughs> they're so mean. No, they're but the trans women that talk about it are mean too. <laughs> you know. What do you mean? Like the the trans women who talk about autogynophilia are mean about themselves, or like they're mean the, about? No, they no, they're mean about like they. Oh yeah. Mo yeah, they hate the theory, and so they're mean about autogynophilia. You know, I I get told all the time by them on the internet that I'm a fetishist and I should stay the hell away from trans people and it's like if they understood the model that I did they'd realize that you know they're the same thing and it's okay to be that thing um <laughs> it's it's fine um yeah it's kind of crazy so so and I think too as well we're obviously in our society we're wrestling with sexuality um as much as with this whole gender thing that's the whole right thing. like what are the bounds of acceptable sexual expression is sort of like a conversation that's happening right now yeah it, it is certainly and you and I think in my opinion actually understanding um transgenderism as a form of sexuality makes it a lot more clear where it is and isn't appropriate <laughs> well, that's for me I'm like oh suddenly like we can figure out where the lines are much easier because you know there's a certain amount of sexuality that's accepted in public like there's a certain amount of masturbatory activity that we just allow and that's I don't see why we can't also allow that for people who have autosexual orientations but then there's some things that we do keep behind closed doors and it's we can easily make those differentiations. So, in, I mean, but for some reason, shifting from one, one mindset to the other is something that like the chasm there is fraught with so much like mimetic immune response for these people that it's just impossible yeah. for them to even make the transition into this other frame of reference. Right. Yeah, like you said, it is a, com 
a completely different paradigm of understanding transgenderism to understand it with this two type model. Um, and the people that don't believe in the two type model, they have developed, you know, if they're, if they're aware of transgender stuff, they've likely developed a lot of mimetic defenses, as you put it, that pres that preserve the mean plex they have in their heads from any outer threats. And I, yeah, the, their defenses are quite strong, um, quite touchy, like it's, yeah, they, they have very strong defenses in, as far as I can tell. And so it's, I, I don't think it'll be, I'm not gonna be trying to convince the people that are already convinced against the theory. I'm just gonna have to convince the people that aren't already propagandized either way. Yeah. And that'll be easy because most people are not propagandized against this theory because it's it's been covered up. So most people haven't even heard <laughs> of it. Yeah. That's a good point. And it does. Yeah. I remember when Raven explained it to me and I kind of had a light bulb bug and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That solves the whole problem of having these three things, sex, gender, and sexual orientation, and apparently them being three totally independent axes <laughs> that right. don't ever overlap, never shall they meet. But then yeah, you can see that gender and sexual orientation or gender expression and sexual orientation may have something to do with each other after all. Right. It's Yeah, once <laughs> it's you hear cool. the theory, it's like, huh. Yeah, it does kind of seem obvious that sexuality, gender, and sex would all be connected in some way. And this theory explains the ways in which they're connected. Yeah, pretty easily as well. If you can just think about it without having yeah, have you, have you been like, Have you been spreading the good word? Oh, I've been spreading the good word. I'm, I'm truly your number one evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> telling everyone. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think, I, I mean, I think it's a great theory and um, it's, yeah, it explains a lot. And I also, something that's come up in my kind of discussing this is just thinking about the uh, place of autoeroticism and sexuality in general and whether or not there's an autoerotic dimension that could possibly be turned towards your, like a homosexual autoerotic orientation. I, and that's totally speculative. Like I have no idea. I haven't researched it, but like that maybe there is a dimension of sexuality that's kind of goes unnoticed with people who are typically heterosexual because it kind of matches what they should be attracted to. But with transgenderism, because it's crossed, you end up with just noticing, oh, okay, there's this dimension of sexuality that's about being turned towards the self. Um, so that's been something we've been kind of discussing in our circles is like what what this might mean for like just understanding sexuality in general and obviously that's an open question in terms of the research but yeah and that's definitely the deeper question here like when I'm explaining this theory to people I try to point out that the deeper more relevant fact here is that it is possible for any sexual orientation that's a, that is attracted to something there is an autosexual version of it that's about attraction to being that thing. Mm -hmm. And that for each types of the each type of autosexual attraction, there's a form of trans identity associated with it. And so basically, yeah, this deeper story that attraction to being itself is the thing that exists. Like that's it, I think it it makes a lot of sense of of things. Yeah. And then also just this idea that there is a there's a side of identity inside of ourselves that in the sense is um maybe pre-sexual or desexual or distinct from our sexual side but then there is like a kind of erotic persona and that this persona might have its own thoughts feelings fantasies imaginations like that that this could be an aspect of um our inner experience that this might be then then of course with the way that things are organized on the internet, people magnetize towards each other because they have certain mindsets or fantasies that are shared. And so then you have population level dynamics emerging in our society now. And 
it would be very interesting to know if some of why this is happening is based on like the erotic self, the erotic experience of the self, um, rather than whatever other like levels of experience we could we're having inside of our identities that are not sexual. And I don't know if there's any research on that either, but that's a fact, that's like an interesting question for me. It's like the, per like a sliding scale of like how much society is a reflection of everyone's kind of erotic inner world being exposed versus this other, these other dimensions of self. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's it's an interesting question of how much of society is ultimately an outgrowth of sexuality and like how much of it is just the sublimation of sexuality. Um, yeah, no, it definitely, since learning more about sexual orientation, it's clear to me that it impacts most people's everyday thoughts, just how they think of various categories of people and interact with various categories of people. It it's just intrinsic to the way they think and so it alters how they think and thus on the large scale alters how society you know is formed and how it functions do you think that the phantom experiences and the mind shift experiences that transgender people are having are actually accurate reflections of what it is like to be the opposite sex or gender or or thing do you think that those things are accurately being experienced or um it depends on how accurate their conception of that thing is because it's these phantoms are based on the person who's experiencing it it's based on their conception of what that thing is you know um like if it's an autogynophile that's that's having say breasts as phantom anatomy if they're if they for some reason had like a huge breast fetish, I'd imagine their phantom breast might be huge, you know. Whereas yes, <laughs> right, yeah. You know, like we can think of that wood shop teacher lady from Canada that had the yes. yeah, absolute legend. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Seriously. it's like yeah, no. With these auto sexual orientations, it's a it's based. It comes. You have like this mental conception of the thing and what it's like. And then that gets imposed on yourself. And so that's why, you know, people that identify as, you know, species that have tails are likely to have experienced phantom tails sometimes. Um, and various other forms of phantom anatomy that correspond to their identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing that um, is quite interesting about about this model is it also reveals um the reality of like meta attraction so could you talk about <laughs> meta attraction yeah. meta attraction yeah um so yeah meta attraction if, if you were to sum it up in a sort of broad sentence it's it's increased attraction to someone else because of what their traits imply about you and with, with auto heterosexuality um it can make you more attracted to other people um, based on how their traits reflect on your sense of gendered embodiment. And so an, an autogynophilic male can want to have sex with men, even though they're not intrinsically attracted to men's bodies, um, because being in a being in, with a man lets them play like a female typical sex role. And that can be very hot for them. And it's as far as I could tell, I think meta attraction, it's responsible for a significant proportion of bisexuality. Um, a much higher, among males, it's a higher proportion than it is among females in terms of the bisexual, bisexuals of each sex. Um, but yeah, meta, like meta androphilia makes a man, an, like an autogynophilic male want to you know, say like perform fellatio or experience like receptive anal intercourse or have men like cat call them and things like that. Um, and and metagynophilia, like meta attraction in an auto, auto androphilic female will um, make them want to 
play like a assertive masculine sex role with a woman so that they can you know be sort of the be a man with a woman and yeah that's basically what meta attraction is is just increased attraction to others because of um how their traits reflect upon you i love it yeah have, have you have you witnessed it before have you seen men that have meta attraction i think it describes me perfectly yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So is it okay if I ask you about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Have Have you ever, um, yeah, like if you're like attract, have you ever been attracted to guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I'd say like, I experience myself as being primarily attracted to women, but then there's also guys. It's a kind of right. like secondary interest. Yeah. And, and like with them, is it, is it more fun to do like sort of the top role or the bottom role? No, bottom role. It's sort of about kind of being feminine. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's like, it's obviously very hot. Like, um, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> obviously, 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 darling, I know. <laughs> we can all agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it's really interesting how like this, this type of, how this heterosexuality can actually lead to, behavior that is technically homosexual in nature in terms of the bodies involved um yeah it's yeah it's, it's oh and when you heard about like meta attraction did it make sense to you well i've, I've just heard that word now about two minutes ago but oh okay i think from, from you explaining like, it there it before I was, I was kind of listening to it and going yeah, no, no, that makes, that actually makes complete sense. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's um, funny because it's like I do, I've got quite an andro, I always describe myself androgynous, but I'm like, I'm quite happy being in a male body and calling myself a man. Um, but I also really like playing with my feminine. Right. And I see you have long hair too, which is, Totally. Whenever I'm trying to scope out AGPs out there, that's always sus. I'm like, oh, that guy's got long hair, you know? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah. No, so again, so your work, I mean, I'm getting it secondhand through Raven, but it's been helpful for me to frame my own personal experience as well. Cool, yeah. And yeah, and I always try to, I try to always make clear that like, it's fine to have this sexuality. Um and just that it'll be cool if more people understand it because then it'll really help with matchmaking i think oh my god yeah of course when right, you talk about this like feminine like th there's like a feminized you know man can be attractive to you know like like can you explain that situation where gender bending is something that becomes attractive in this context um Yeah, like what about it? Like so so what you've said is like if you're if you're a GP, you would be attracted you could be attracted to a, a woman, right? So you're still like expressing right. heterosexuality, but a yeah. woman who's more masculinized, like maybe she's you know, more dominant or she has more hair or like she's Oh yeah, I've definitely increased I experienced increased attraction to those women for sure. Yeah. Rides a motorcycle. Yeah, <laughs> right. And yeah, this this meta attraction, it's it's not it's not always for like someone of the same sex. It can also be for someone of the other sex, just that has a cross gender shift in traits. You know, like like me for instance, I can be attracted to women that are masculine and have short hair and like muscles and things like that. Um, like that, they become more attractive <laughs> than the really feminine ones. And it's it's because of meta attraction that this happens. And yeah, I just think it'd be really great if people understood this because it's so sad when I see stories about people getting married and having kids and then like the husband decides to transition and they're like just the complete like destruction of the that family structure that they they built. It's it's kind of like a tragedy, I think, for the wife a lot of the time. And It'd just be really great if people 
when they just start dating, if they could just say, hey, I have this aspect of my sexuality, it's not going to go away. If that's a deal breaker for you, that's fine. But like, it's important that you know this. It's, it's interesting what you just said, Phil, as well, because I experience the same thing as you with the quite strong attraction to masculinized women. Yeah. But then there's also an interesting nuance in this that's quite fun to tease out to do with, I don't know if I can say it better than where the attraction is processed. So to explain what I mean, like if I'm looking at porn, I love really feminine women. But if it's like in person, if it's embodied, then I like the masculine presence in the woman. Whereas if it's just got happening visually, then a kind of like butchy woman, no, it doesn't really turn me on. It has to be physical. It has to be something I kind of feel in my body rather than something I see with the eye. Right. Well, yeah, if it's porn, like you're not involved. But if it's if it's in real life, then it can implicitly reflect upon you. Mm. You know, so that makes sense. Yeah, I think with the porn, it's much more about kind of just enjoying a kind of imaginary union with that intensely feminine body in an autoerotic way. Yeah, that's that's a common thing for like when autogynophilic males will look at porn, they'll just imagine themselves in the woman's position. And it, 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 it's not like they're intentionally thinking, oh, I'm going to do that. It just it just happens. That's what they imagine and they like it the most. Yeah, I just as we're having this conversation, I just can't shake the thought that this this paradigm also disrupts the whole structure of like L B G T Q L W X Y Z because uh-huh. basically what you're saying is like well okay first of all we've already talked like bisexuality then become I mean this this thing that's like a kind of a symptom of like multiple different directions of sexual orientation so as a category it's kind of like a bit useless. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different kinds of bisexuality exactly yeah. and and then i guess the one of the things you talk about in the, the book is like there's basically two types of queer <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no i yeah basically there's same-sex attraction and there's cross-gender attraction you know which is what my book is about and as far as I can tell, when it comes to the gender-based proportion of the LGBTQ alphabet soup, um, it's just these two sexual predispositions that qualify someone for inclusion in any of these letters. And so basically, yeah, in my book, I break down the LGBTQ umbrella into the a, a binary, <laughs> the two pre- sexual predispositions of which it is comprised. And... And, and I call the same-sex attraction non-heterosexuality and the cross-gender attraction I call auto-heterosexuality and just like can abbreviate it as non-het and auto-het. But it's, yeah, I sort of think of it as the non-het and auto-het political coalition. These, these people with these two types of sexual predispositions that are trying to, you know, combine forces because they have mutual interest in pr- preserving their rights. You know, they'll, they'll want similar legislation and social policies and things like that. And so, yeah. But do they? Like, I, I think uh, that- Sometimes, sometimes. There's definitely exactly. real conflicts, for sure. Like, you know, the conflict between the autogon files and the lesbians, it's real. And <laughs> like, there, there is, there's conflicts, like the desires of these two groups are sometimes in conflict, but in terms of just how the broader society treats gender minorities, it does make strategic sense for them to band together for various political purposes. It has made strategic sense, but I wonder, like, because <laughs> there's a couple different things going on right now with the, with, the, with the LBGTQ thing. It has become a bureaucratic, like, political um structure that has its own kind of nonprofit machine that's like replicating itself in society in a way it's kind of turned itself into a dominant culture that has lost a lot of its soul right and yeah. you know, that's my sense of it and the there's also all of these internal conflicts that that have yet to be resolved that are all on, also expressing themselves on a political level and in that sense there feels like a fragility to this form of identification that that arises out of the sexual orientation and something like this theory 
because it disrupts so much like we're talking about social infrastructure here we're talking about massive amounts of money being moved around based on oh, yeah. these categories existing like that this actually might be good like for renewing like queer culture and and starting at a new place a new more like sensible place in terms of having self-awareness and so people can actually come together and know who they are and know who the other people around them are and know how to differentiate themselves. And um, I think it could, I, th I mean, I, it's going to start underground obviously because this is extremely subversive. This is like <laughs> really yeah. threatening situation. Right. <laughs> so many special interests um, and people's jobs and personal feelings and I mean, the yeah. politics of the united states like and other countries like really big you're you were really shooting high for like right no i i really am but like you know someone's got to do it uh, yeah, so oh, i yeah. am <laughs> and yeah it, it's just like there's just there's this gender religion that formed in the last 10 years and you know to the the some of the feminists they call it gender ideology you both of you know what i'm talking about this gender religion and this theory I'm proposing will just completely, it just has the potential to completely like flip the table, just like completely throw out that whole gender religion because in the same way that adopting the theory of evolution, you know, made atheism more tenable for people, you know, it was sort of a conflict against God, the God mean plex. Um, this autosexual theory has the potential to just completely obliterate the gender religion um and and but ultimately arrive at a similar place in terms of um po policy and social norms and that like we still you know respect people's pronouns and their and their ability to chart their own destiny with whether they want to transition and things like that but we just do it without the the gender woo you know just gender science instead of gender woo is what i'm trying to accomplish here Sure. Where it seems interesting to me, right, is that the autosexual theory aligns strongly with the the work of psychoanalysis, which basically looks at the foundation of the subject experience is fantasy and desire. Whereas there's the, you might say, the scientific materialist paradigm that wants to say the foundation of the subject is the matter that's there. And that's a tension that has continued in academic discourse and it still seems i i think part of the issue with what you're calling the the gender religion is that they're actually despite some of the insights coming out of the work for example of freud and his later students actually trying to force a scientific reductionist mindset to things so kind of saying there is an essence to sex and that's kind of where the conservative or the very liberal side kind of overlap is that the conservative side obviously just say there's men and there's women foundations done but you could say the the gender religion side, they're kind of saying, well, if you're born in a man's body, but you're a woman, you're clearly a woman. And it, you, everyone has to treat you, you're a woman, full stuff. Anyone who challenges you on that is evil. Because it's an essence. It's an absolute right. essence. And, but there's no, you can complete, obviously it's completely based on contradiction. And you can just, you can fucking pull it apart, but it doesn't matter because it's an essence that's pure. Whereas the, um, your theory, as I said, by placing fantasy structure first, by placing desire first, it allows you to switch the way you're thinking about the whole conversation. Yeah, no, it definitely, it, com it completely upends the typical way that discourse about this is had. And in a way that I noticed ends up being far more reasonable. Um, and yeah, and I'm a fan of logic and reason. So I, I've generally liked what I've seen in terms of the discourse I see among self-aware autogynophiles and androphiles. They're they're pretty reasonable about um, the sort of policy they want to implement. You know, like the, they'll 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 strongly defend people's right to transition still, of course. But then maybe be like, hey, maybe don't put, you know, males in female sports. You know, like there's there's you know, or don't put males in female jails. Like there, there's situations like that, which are just kind of like obviously ludicrous once you um, understand, once you're outside of the gender religion and, and seeing things more from the like autosexual theory perspective. 
there's just some policies that don't make sense. Totally. And, and it's precisely those examples where it's the essentialist theory that's causing all of the issues. Whereas people are saying, well, if someone has transitioned to being a woman, they are a woman, they were always a woman. And so they should absolutely be able to compete against biological women. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I guess my theory is still, it's essentialist, but not in the way of saying like what, a, like not in terms of saying what a man or a woman is. It's more essentialist in, in terms of saying um, this is why people feel that they're men or women. Yeah. The found fantasy is the foundation. Yeah, the, des the, the desire, the great wish to be the thing. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing that is interesting as well is, um, I'm going to butcher this word, I think, but gynandromorphophilia. Nailed it. Gynandromorphophilia. Yeah, yeah gynandromorphophilia. Usually we call it GAMP. Um, GAMP. Because that... <laughs> there's another Just album cause... that's raven's second solo album Gamp. yeah oh, Gamp. what was the first one also true like <laughs> number one know. stalker was number one and then <laughs> dine andro i would forgotten it already but that's number two dine andro morphophilia <laughs> yeah it, um, that's just attraction to trans women or basically attraction to women with dicks is is that's the aesthetic and yeah. Typically, trans women call men with this attraction, they call them chasers, which is short for tranny chaser. But, you know, trannies faux pas now, so people just say chaser. Um, but, yeah, a lot of men have this attraction. I'd say about 5% seem to have it pretty strongly. Um, and it's also highly correlated with autogynephilia. Like, if, if I hear of a guy that's attract, like particularly attracted to trans women... I will assume that he's also autogynephilic unless I hear otherwise, um, particularly if they identify as bisexual. Um, if there's a bisexual GAMP man, um, that there's a very good chance that they're autogynephilic because um, there's, there's just a high correlation between, you know, wanting to be a trans woman and being attracted to them. Yeah, and I mean, I think that this is, once again, okay, in the like LBGT, you know, this is another yeah. form of sexual attraction, right? That's like, or a trans person particularly. And, you know, that could be its own identity. Right, like, but... is that a third type of propensity, right? Because it's like, it or... has the same sex attraction element of like, they literally are the same sex. Yeah. But it's, in terms of what is attracting the person, it's it's a heterosexual attraction. And so it kind of, and it's, and it's highly associated with this auto-heterosexuality. And so... Yeah, GAMP kind of blurs the lines between the the two types of queer that I was talking about earlier. It kind of has elements of both yeah. of them. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing like phenomenon. And um, yeah, I mean, and then I also I wonder is there also cases of like um, autoandrophiles being interested in in GAMPs, or is that less common? Um, yeah, there is. I've anecdotally seen that there hasn't been much research on autoandrophiles yet. Um, and I know at least one um, gender variant female who is an androgynam. <laughs> this this can be the flip of GAMP. This is androgynomorphophilia. It's just flipping the andro and gyne, but it's basically attraction to to trans men, like attraction okay. to like a man with a vulva. Like some autoandrophilic females are attracted to that type. A person and want to get in a relationship with them yeah the matchmaking on this would be like so perfect yeah. right it'll like, clear up so much so people much. be like oh i understand my sexual psychology now now i can look for people that fit in with that and also know how to talk to them about their sexuality to see if we're a fit mm -hmm. yeah that makes total sense uh, have you heard about the trans maxing people yeah yeah what do you think about that, the, these folks i mean that that guy that wrote that manifesto i i mean i personally think that individual is a bit wacky um well, but yeah. <laughs> there, there there is something to um I, I mean 
it makes sense. Like if you're an incel and you're also autogynephilic and you would like, if you can't get girlfriends, become girlfriend, you know, as the logic, um, it, it makes sense. You know, if you can't get a girl, become the girl. Become the girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, that mean, does get into like the, yeah, I was thinking about this earlier, just a thought that popped into my head because one of you was talking about how when we're, we're just able to express our sexuality much more now than we would have been, say, 100 years ago. And we kind of think of this as having been the product of the big sexual revolution in the 60s. But actually, the internet is like a second sexual revolution that you perhaps should think separately to the 60s one because it allows for just an almost non-stop... Um, potentially autoerotic exploration of whatever the sexual self is with no boundaries other than literally the limits of your own physical exhaustion. And so this thing of the incel, if you can't get girlfriend, become girlfriend. I wonder if that's happening to a lot of people simply like, well, there's more of it happening because these latent tendencies that perhaps just wouldn't have been activated in a society where we didn't have the internet can now be gone into, especially if people are spending time alone, can go into Reddit boards, they can start to discover um, the desire to be in the feminine position, for example, if you're a man, and then to go down yeah. that. I agree that that is, I think it is happening more. And as far as I could tell, it did transition, did surge during uh, the COVID shutdowns. So it does seem that when a bunch of people were forced to be at home alone, they a lot of them decided to transition. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've also heard of cases of like the trender. Some of the females that were trenders decided to detransition during that time because they're like, "Oh, there's nobody to show that I'm this gender person." So what's the point? Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of people transitioned um, once suddenly everyone was at home alone. See, that is interesting because that kind of suggests to me that there is a kind of latent autoeroticism in everybody. Well, it's in a lot of people, a lot more people than we currently know. I would say yeah. it's not in at least this, the type of autoeroticism that my book is about, it's not in everybody, mm -hmm. but it, it's most common for it to manifest, I would say, just a little bit. It's sort of like a, you know, a Pareto distribution where most people just have it a little bit, and there'll be some people that have it real strongly, but. For the most part, it'll just there's there'll be a lot of guys that are like, yeah, I can sort of see the appeal of that, but it's not like a, a central part of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. Which I think oh, I was just gonna say because I think the other thing about this theory, it really like makes a case for like a pragmatic approach to transition, and you can understand mm -hmm. like at these different levels, like how to play around with with your level of kind of arousal or satisfaction that you get from going into either like the physiological or the sartorial or the different like behavioral dimensions of whatever the cross gender cross entity is inside of you but you know you may not need to go all the way in order to kind of compose a life that allows for you to to take the best of this um this twerk you know whatever like quirk of, yeah. of your of your existence um yeah, because you and then the other thing about it is you also speak about um, the relationship with the entity as yeah. being something similar to like the dynamics of a romantic relationship. Um, and like your euphoria is going to really come on really hard in the beginning and then things will start to kind of settle down. And so there's ways to think about transition um, much more strategically than just like pushing the button on accelerating <laughs> on like medical transsexualism like yeah, immediately yeah. upon reporting gender dysphoria you know what I mean yeah I'm glad you brought this up because it's like it, it does make it much easier to think through the pragmatism of transition where once you understand that you, you're having like someone that just decided to stop repressing is, is having new relationship energy with that inner cross-gender self right and we it's general when it comes to romance it's kind of conventional wisdom that like hey don't get married in like six months you know don't buy a house with this person that you've only been dating for one year you know there's 
there's there's sort of like a yeah don't make too big of a commitment until you're very sure about it you know until after the honeymoon period is gone and so that's what's something important about this theory is it can help people realize like you like you should stop like it's good to stop repressing um but then once you do be it be conscious that at first there will be this intense rush this mood boost of new relationship energy but that this will tend to develop into more of a long like more of a companionate deeper love bond over time that that can lead to transsexualism um but doesn't always do so yeah especially if you also have um persistent aloe sexuality where you may you know also be served by a bond with another person and also get sexual satisfaction from that it may be that this the autosexual part of you is just a component of your overall sexual experience rather than and relationship experience rather than the entirety of that thing or maybe it happens right. later in life you know maybe when you're 50 you're like okay i'm gonna go for the full thing now what do you think yeah and your wife's like great because i'm gonna masculinize now and then we'll be this like <laughs> weird like <laughs> yeah straight post. with extra steps yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. um so yeah i mean i think and then you can also begin to see this as like a life cycle thing just like how you know if you're really thinking about how to live your life well you do have to think about okay what's my future self going to be um thankful for right and and how do i prepare for that future future state and how do i take advantage of where i'm at now in my life and find the things that i want as a young person and the partner that i want or do i want kids or not you know all of those things can kind of be understood over this like life cycle this potential life cycle of this right the expression of this um sexuality um and it's so interesting like the thing that that does excite me as well about the, the the political level of this is like because actually it simplifies the politics is that now it's like okay maybe then queerness if we want to just call it that can go back just to culture right and and in culture like there's so much variability that can go beyond just like what your rights are you know and the way that cultures end up kind of forcing themselves into political category like i'd love to see a flourishing of the queerness um, of the people in this world that isn't so bounded by like the bricks and mortars and uh, kind of political structure that right now corrals people with these who identify these experiences into certain stories and narratives and ways of recognizing themselves in society. And I think it would be really good for the queers like to be liberated from having to see themselves as constantly vigilantly politically involved for in every aspect of their of their life right. and existence yeah it would be nice if yeah with with having this alternative model proposed that it'll give i'm hoping it'll give queer people more flexibility in how they think about themselves and their role politically because right now they sort of get slotted into like oh you're queer therefore you have to buy into queer theory and critical theory and basically become like uh, in favor of luxury gay space communism you know (laughs) that that whole platform (laughs) um (laughs) so um yeah i'm hoping that this this theory will just it's gonna i i do think it has a good chance of absolutely obliterating gender ideology. Um, And I think that'll be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of what one of uh, our good friends who's always on this podcast, Mr. Bard said, so he's, he was an old school member of the, um, I guess the queer scene. Right. And he said, what people need to understand is all of the good gay theorists, died of AIDS. So it's only right, yeah. the unfucked ones who died, who lived, who then went on to have the positions of cultural authority, the positions in academia, and mentored the next generation. So we've literally yeah, yeah. lost an entire generation of the horny, sexy, affirmative, smart gays. 
Right, and only the like paranoid, angsty ones remained. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, the ones that that whose sense of self preservation and fear kept them away from doing the behaviors that led to contracting HIV. And it's like the ones that said, "Fuck it, I'm going to do it anyways." They died. And so, yeah, that I think that definitely has had a huge impact on what present like queer culture is, so to speak. Yeah, and now we have a new generation like, of people like, who can, you know, come into understanding themselves as queer with a different, different understanding than what's been created by this, like, you know, selected for paranoid or, you know, kind of risk averse generation of, of political right. activists, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's tremendously exciting. I really hope that that it's not just like shadow banned this idea that it like <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a real fear that like that's a real that's a real. I, I was issue. worried about it. So like when when Musk took over Twitter, I was like, thank God, just just because <laughs> just just because it'll benefit me personally, not because yeah. like I care about particular billionaires or anything, but just because like <laughs> great the the blue tribe cannot shadow ban me from Twitter now, you know, yeah. which is a big deal. Yeah. yeah, no, I expect to get banned a lot of places. Um, it's already against the rules in basically all the trans subreddits. To You're not allowed to talk positively about this theory. You can't, if you talk about autogynephilia or autoantrophilia, it, it has to be to criticize the concepts and the theory. You can't say that I am this thing and it's okay and it's right. Um, you'll get wow. banned. God, it's so, it's Such a big board. symptom. Yeah. Let's fucking push the button. Yeah, I know, right? right? Well, you always have a home on this pod- podcast to talk about this, <laughs> just so you know. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, I've enjoyed talking about this in person too when you were in the States. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's really, yeah, I mean, it totally changed my life to, to meet you and to learn about this. And yeah, I'm just like, wow. I'm post Phil, really. <laughs> post Phil. <laughs> there's a before and after um yeah I'll, and while we're on the subject I you know I really would like um for you to yeah advocate for resources here on this platform and like have it be known to anybody in the audience that Phil is doing this all because he gives a shit about this situation and yeah. needs resources and funding and if you care about intellectuals and people who are fighting for freedom of speech, then Phil is somebody to contact and to give money to. Um, oh, thank, yeah, thank you, Raven. Yeah, I do need money because I had funding um, for most of the project, a, a rich autogynophile um, named Andrew Conru. Um, he, he, he's the founder of Adult Friend Finder and he funded um, the bulk of the production of the book. And, but, now that that's over, I do need money and royalties don't come in yet. So um, yeah, if anyone wants to send me money to help defenestrate gender ideology, like that's what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I guess it'd be a good point for me to say where people can find me, right? Yeah, let's like, do it. Let's hear about you. Yeah. Um, so the name of the book is Auto Heterosexual Attracted to Being the Other Sex. It is about autoantrophilia, autogynephilia, and the broader autosexual theory of trans identity that includes trans, all the other types of trans. They're, they're in there. There's a nice chart. It's all explained. Um, and I posted the first 15 chapters already on Twitter. Um, anyone can find me on Twitter at, at autogynephilic, because my kind had so much shame that that name was still available. Um, <laughs> after all that time and so I took it and um yeah you can find me on twitter at at autogynephilic I have a pinned post that is a directory that links to the first 15 plus chapters of the book and you can like spread these ideas simply by retweeting the various chapters and various threads it's all organized there and um, I also have a sub stack which you can find at phililly.substack.com and I've also posted the first chapter there which is a little more of a readable format than Twitter Um, but I put stuff on Twitter because that's kind of the commons and that's where the meme plexes develop and that's that's the the battleground of ideas and so I've been 
making sure that almost the entire book, I'm going to leave one chapter out, um, but I will upload all the other chapters to Twitter. And yeah, and I'll send you um, like a PayPal link for the show notes or whatever. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, people, yeah, people can find me. Yeah, I do need money and people can find me at, you just search my name, Phil Illy. Um, mm-hmm. It's like silly without the S. And um, I have this book that's, um, and yeah, I think it's very promising in terms of it, it having a big impact. Um, it'll just, it just needs to reach enough people at first to blow up. It needs to trigger some sort of controversy or something. Yeah. Um, but that You need but to then, do a talk on a student campus. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. No, I missed one a couple of weeks ago. There was one I found out after the fact I could have gone downtown and that would have helped a lot, but yeah. <laughs> I need something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll talk media yeah, strategy pretty... behind closed doors, but we, we, we yeah. should talk about how to get you right, yeah. into the public um, eye. But yeah, that's uh, that's that's the book. Um, I'm just trying to to make this orientation understood by people so that they can know why they want to get serious medical interventions and why they feel gender dysphoria. I think understanding the why behind it can remove some of the sting of gender dysphoria, um, can help you realize that it can be, you don't have to take it seriously all the time. You, you know, you can see a sort of like a brain quirk or a miswiring, you know, whenever the bad things are happening. Um, yeah, basically this is a sexual orientation that people need to know about. And so I'm, making it known amazing thank you so much yeah yeah thank you both owen and raven for having me on it's been a pleasure to meet you i hope we get to meet again and cross paths in person one day yeah i'm definitely down to talk again and if you're ever in portland that's where i live of course you're in portland (laughs) right we're gonna have to ship you over here to london at some point yeah we'll see if i get (laughs) if i get run out of portland maybe Yeah. yeah yeah well amazing thank thank you so much and thanks to everybody who's been listening make sure to go and follow phil on various platforms and hopefully we'll have you back on the podcast bye